Uh, I think it was Michael Parkinson who always used to like to say on his show, uh, the bigger the star, the shorter the introduction. And uh, I think there is a case for that here. Will you give a warm welcome to Jeff Barrow? Thank you. <clears throat> So can you, can you, uh, are you happy evoking the spirit of Ben for the... Not really. <laughs> no. You can't it's be It's far him. more articulate than I am when it comes to talk about these matters. So, um, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. We've, lo we've lost the articulate one yeah, yeah. already. Oh, and I'm drinking as well. So oh. You've doubled, doubled down on that one. <laughs> Crikey, right. I'm going to need more beers quickly. Yeah. Um, Jeff, I want to start on a real downer. I want to go... I want to take it, you Cheers. know, keep getting the mood really low and sombre straight away. Uh, partly because I want to go to the late 1990s. That's oh, all right. God. Do you why mind? Would, why would anyone <laughs> want to do that? Uh, yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, you have, over your career so far, you have so many amazing ways of contacting music, whether you're making it, we're remixing it, distributing it in some way, you know... I was fascinated to read that uh, at what seemed to be a very sort of successful point in your career, you, you had a bit of a faltering. Uh, music seemed to lose something for you. And I just wanted to dig into that a bit. Um, I'm just trying to think when that was. I often feel like that about music, so it's, it's finding out which... I, I gave up music for a few years. Um, uh, we, we released Dummy and, and did our second album. The second album was like just a, not a very good experience. Um, and then um, uh, we did a tour, and the tour were, was like a world tour. We, we, we got lucky in some way. The, uh, the Verve had split up. And I don't mean we got lucky because <laughs> the Verve split up. I don't mean <laughs> as, as a group of people, as the yeah. kind of human race got lucky. I mean that um, <laughs> Port, Port they got lucky in a sense because they were headlining a lot of the festivals. So we, we were playing underneath them, and so we got bumped up. Right. Um, and so it meant we could play these, you know, these these festivals, and it kind of promoted us further. But um, we did a we did basically a year and a half tour, and um, we all got divorced. We all had kind of you know drink and other problems, and and um, you are starting right at the yeah. bottom, aren't you? No, it's, and then, it's, um, gonna, it's gonna get really. <laughs> it doesn't get any better, this, really. Yeah. Sorry, if you want to go now. We don't um, want to end on the uh, on the huge breakups oh, and the drugs, do we? Yeah, oh, do yeah exactly. Um, okay. And so I um, kind of I that one of the last places we played was Australia, and they and it seemed like it was sunny there quite a lot, and um, so I just moved. I moved there, moved myself right. there. Didn't know anyone. Um, just place myself in a in a in a cheap hotel on King's Cross like all the backpackers do but but I was actually <laughs> randomly quite lonely because I wasn't right. a backpacker right. so <laughs> I was just on my own in this hotel you were room. sort of glamorous backpacker yeah. in a hotel <laughs> yeah, room just like a couple Crikey. of meal in the bank no I, I, I wasn't that much sure. how bleak anyway thanks for coming yeah, yeah that's it um, don't do drugs kids um so so um yeah, so I was I lived there and I kind of just got fed up with music. I got yeah. fed up with got fed up with the way I was making music. It didn't appeal to me anymore. Um, you know, a, a samplers and, and Ataris and and um, kind of hiring out uh, big studios, uh, orchestral things that I wasn't particularly happy about. That you would kind of want you would try and relay what you wanted kind of uh, on a sonic level to people and strings, and it would always end up too normal. I don't right. mean that kind of... When well, we will work with Nick Ingman, which he's an amazing guy. Um, but it was just like my inability to work out... I, I, I am, a, I suppose, a drummer as a, a, by heart, and, um, and, but I'd lost, I, I hadn't found the ability to actually be actually musical myself. You know, like sampling... Chopping stuff up and making collages and stuff and, and, and being into hip hop is one thing, but actually kind of composing it was a you know it's a completely different thing. And um and and I couldn't find the connection of where to go next. Right. And I knew where I wanted to go, but I I wasn't able to do it and I was knackered. So right. so I just I actually gave up music for a few years and um but I set up Invader Records in Australia with a guy that I found who's, who's a really nice guy, still a mate now, and we did an album called Quakers together, which is a hip-hop record yeah. for Stone Throw. And, and, um, and it wasn't until I got back to England, um, a mate of mine, Fat Paul, who's like a legend in Bristol, 
Um, he's, he's ran his own record label, his studio. He's, he's put on some amazing gigs. And um, he had a night and he said, look, come down. There's this band called Gonga, uh, like a heavy metal band, and, and come and see them because I think you'll like them. And they might be good if you're thinking about setting up Invader in England. And I went and saw them and it was like, they were just Sabbath, basically, but r- right. like real rough and ready. But I got the same impact from them um, the, when I first heard Public Enemy and, 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 and that really inspired me to make music. And what I realised, I've been sucked into the music industry as a, in a commercial sense for a couple of years. Mm. And dance music was kind of like at its kind of most popular. And I didn't like dance music. I never particularly... Yeah did, except from early Acid House and stuff, and, and I realised that I'd been sucked into the industry, and I didn't know, you know, people were saying, oh, you're going to have to, you've got to write a radio record next time, you've got, and I was thinking, oh, it's not... So one. you felt you were being drawn on a, on a, a sort of a ratchet that was only going one way, sort of big business music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it was like Paul said, it was a big business kind of thing, and, um, and successful, but I'd completely lost the, the reason to make music and to enjoy it. Yeah. So I saw this band Gonga and then everything changed. I was like, right, this is, I've found some music I like and it's nothing to do with kind of dance music and right. bikinis and big sunglasses and that <laughs> whole dance music thing. I bet you look good in a bikini. Don't you? I think you're hard on yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> so going back a bit from there. Oh, by the way, I should say that we will, around six o'clock, we'll, we'll open up for questions, but if... You know, while we're talking, if anyone has anything burning they want to ask, um, do stick your hand up and we'll try and incorporate it in the conversation as it's going rather than sticking it at the end. Um, so going back then to your initial, Im- you know, impulses and enthusiasms, was the kit the first instrument you got your hands on? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I played drums when I was nine. Um, I hated every minute of it. It was kind of uh, forced to go to these drum lessons with a guy. He was a really good guy. He, was a, he played at Butlin's. And I was a brilliant drummer. And, um, and he, uh, to be honest, I'm dyslexic, so the idea of reading music was, was never going to work. So um, he was, we learned from this book called The Art of the Drummer, which is like a very 70s kind of prog. Right. You know, even the cover of it was brilliantly prog, you know. And, um, and, but he made this fatal error, which was he used to, I would say, oh, I'm not too sure about this. And he would then play it. And as soon as he played it, I would have it. I would, know, I would just copy it. Oh, right. Yeah. And then look at the page like I knew what I was, I was, you know, knew what I was doing. So if you, if you heard it, you could do it. If I heard oh, yeah. it, that, that's yeah, yeah. one thing that I'm not too bad at. So, um. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, and I played, played drums and then got into kind of, um, then got into hip hop. And I always was, you know, through electro and then into DJing. And then the idea of buying, I had a little sampler that was one of those ones that had the, the dog bark on it and the lion roared. And, um, and John Shuttleworth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I wish I was good at him, man. You know, but, um, but yeah, and it had, a, it had a kind of like a two point something second low, low bandwidth kind of sample rate. Yeah. And um, so if I found if I, if I put kind of like breakbeat records on really, really fast, it would last for ages, you know, you could get two bars out of it, you know. Yeah. So I started compo- like, composing. Why did I say that word? Well, it's funny. We were discussing that before. Yeah, no, Are I, you I, uncomfortable I, with the, yeah, being I called yeah, a composer? Yeah. Compo- I, I, I think it's because I'm in this kind of place, I'd say. You should have brought you a powdered wig <laughs> yeah, for you to yeah. wear. So, um, so I write music yeah. and um, to cassette and then kind of work with terrible local rap guys. And, and then... Um, um, were you, ter- were you um, scratching as well, using turntables? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I mean, you know, uh, I kind of di- that, the idea of my love for that died really early on, um, even though I, that was kind of supposed my main instrument, you know. Um, yeah. I've really, it, by the end of Dummy, I was really kind of over it, you know. Right. The whole DJ thing. Right? Yeah. I wanted to do other stuff, but. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, Quakers was, was nothing to do with oats. It's more to do with earthquakes, really, isn't it, as a, as a yeah, release? Yeah. yeah, it was just... Um, yeah, Quakers, we've virtually just, just about to finish the second one now. Um, so how long was that between first and second? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't really can't, I can't... I'm not very good at yeah. knowing those, as you can tell by the Pause Air records, that it doesn't yeah. quite work out that way. 
Because there always seems to be a trick question in any interview with you, which is, so when's the next port you said album out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I know what I want to do next, and I know exactly, I know exactly what I want it to sound like, and, but I'm just not there. I'm just, I, I can't, for some reason, find, I can't find a link into it. I know exactly what instruments I want to use and everything else, but I just, I, for some reason, there's a bit of a wall, and I can't, every time I kind of go to climb it, I just fall off. Right, um, right. So, um, but, you know, I just need to spend more time at it. But there are lots of walls, cause there are lo and so no one can complain that there isn't output, stuff like Beak, for instance. Yeah. Um, and they all seem to, all these different outlets seem to have a slightly different way of working. And I was interested in how the Beak, that first Beak album was made, which yeah, seems again to be sort of slightly turning away from all of the trickery. It's reactionary, really. Yeah, yeah it's, it's reactionary. What it is, is, is the, the music industry tells, you know, kind of uh, everyone working on kind of Ableton and, the, you know, and all, like the, you know, hip hop and these beats and these samples and all that stuff. So uh, my, uh, my general kind of point of view of that is I just get, f I just get angry about it, that music all sounds the same. So I, go in a completely opposite direction, which is just get the drum kit out. Yeah. And, um, you know, find two players that I really liked, either were in other bands that were signed to my, uh, my label, Invader. Yeah. And we just got together. We did this thing called the Acid Test, which was a Christmas party, and then loads of people from the band, we would get together and just jam for, you know, for a night. And then um, two of the guys, Matt, who was Team Brick, and, and Billy from Fuzz Against Junk, bass player, yeah. just we got together in a room, set up the instruments, push record, and the first thing we ever recorded is the first thing on the album. Right. Um, and it's not very good. I mean, <laughs> I, but I, I, but the thing is, it's not meant to be. It's kind of not meant to... Um, it, for us three at that time, it wasn't yeah. really meant for anyone to hear. It was just... I, I completely dropped that thing of kind of, you know, everything's got to be this grand thing. It's got to be perfect. It's got yeah. to be... Polished. To polished perfection. and all that stuff. It's, I just like the idea of those records you stumble upon that... That yeah. are good in places and awful in other places. And the yeah, rule it used to happen a you... lot, didn't it? But now people yeah. can't make those records, or they try not to make those records. Yeah. Well, it's a sort of weird thing about the world of computers and music, which is that we seem to we're able to make apparently very perfect things, and then people spend quite a lot of time trying to reintroduce human error and mm. grit and yeah. you know distortion and problems. You know, yeah. whereas why not just set a mic up and record? And you'll, you'll get. I don't chance. know. It's, it, people, yeah, people just find what if it, music makes people happy. That's ultimately that's that's great, isn't it? And if yeah. it makes them money, even better. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, it's a difficult industry, isn't it? So. Yeah. Tell, I mean, if I was sort of setting up um, a music dating app, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, am I... Am I think I you've hit on something. Yeah, then. here we go. Tinder for... And we're going to start tonight. Tinder for gigs. <laughs> you know, you get I've five got... minutes looking at each <laughs> other and then you've got to swap tables. <laughs> Having done a beautiful duet. I would sort of... Uh, let, I'm turning now to Ben Salisbury, you know, thinking... Um, Having heard your music together, it makes a huge amount of sense, but you mm. could be forgiven for looking at, say, some of the David Attenborough music that he's written and picking some of your stuff and going, wow, how did these two ended up, end up, you know, collaborating? And get it's together? very simple. We both play for the worst over 40s football team in the world. Ah, finally, um, the explanation. Called, and we're called Brian Munich. Brian, um, Brian, Brian, Brian Munich. Brian Munich, yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, we, we play uh, um, in the Bristol Casual League, which is for was meant to be just a load of dads that never w would, you know, could never be good enough to play for anyone proper, you know. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, we've been playing football. I knew that he was worked, uh, you know, in composing music yeah. for, for, uh, for TV and film. And, um, and he knew what I did. But, you know, you just play football, you have a pint afterwards. And, um, and I think it was, I was doing, I was working on the, Banksy film, Exit Through the Gift Shop. Yeah. Did you, were you music supervising on that or, or whatever it's called? I don't you know, know. whatever. You did some, something. <laughs> yeah, I did something. Yeah. I mean, basically, he had um, a lot of, uh, it was made with a company that kind of do a lot of, uh, um, like, how clean is your house kind of TV shows, you yeah. know. So it kind of used a lot of kind of, like, library stuff. 
um, just to kind of, uh, you know, Terry's French. So it's like, you know, like, you know, uh, <laughs> and I was like, really, do you want to go in this direction? Is this, is, and it all made sense because it was very tongue in cheek, very funny. And, and um, but there were some bits when it when it wanted to kind of talk about hip hop and street art that basically needed an you know an injection of real music and not kind of not ironic, what, sort not of, ironic, yeah. and not stuff made for libraries to say hip hop beat one. Yeah, you know what I mean. It had to be the yeah. real deal. So um, and that's why I was brought in to do it. And um, and the idea was that there was I came up with this idea about recording a school orchestra playing terrible versions of um, popular songs and, and using that yeah. in it as well. Yeah. And that's when I spoke to Ben. I said, how easy would it be to get them sounding really bad, you know? And he said, not hard at all. <laughs> um, and then we just started chatting. And I can't remember. It's like he ultimately he had this knowledge about music picture and yeah. I didn't. I mean, I watched a lot of films, I collected an awful lot of soundtracks, and soundtracks have been so important part of Port of Ed's history. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because a lot of our samples were coming from, you know, you know, the Pink Panther and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, yeah, lots, lots of, lots of, of stuff, yeah. you know, we were both, Adrian introduced me to the Icarus file, and, and I was really into John Carpenter, and, and yeah. so we kind of met in that way, and then um, so, so Ben had this incredible knowledge of, uh, and a real kind of proper kind of BBC way of, you know, uh, okay, this is, uh, this is where the panther runs through the, yeah. you know, whatever. And, and, um, this is what we would do here. And, and I didn't have a clue about that. So we both brought, when we, we were talking, it was just like, as soon as he said something, I would learn something. As soon as I, hopefully I said something, he would learn something as yeah, well. Yeah. And we, we both have very, grew up in very similar circumstances. I mean, we were both big Howard Jones fans. Right. And, um, you know, kind yeah. of like terrible kind of, <laughs> you know, like kind of Duran Duran and, and, yeah. and, and Monkey and those kind yeah, of TV yeah. shows. And um, so we, we've, we've had that about us. So we're coming from different angles. And now, actually, we're more, we're in a similar uh, you There's know, a real crossover. Yeah, it's middle. a total yeah. crossover. There's a really yeah. lovely quote. I think it was Ben talking about how you work See, I told together. You he's far yeah. better than the I. articulate guy, the <laughs> other guy yeah. who really is good at speaking. You know, no, um, he he's a really nice way he puts it. He says, you know, that you it's like you two. You have a block of stone, and he might be there chiseling out the face, and you're there chiseling out the legs, whatever. And you have your different parts that you the do bum. brilliantly. Yeah, yeah, the bum or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, and, and and the whole then sort of works. So, how do we get from you playing quite awful football and trying to make children sound awful to um, well, that the never Judge Dredd? Yeah, well, that never happened. So, um, so, a guy that I met through a record label, uh, Richard Russell, who runs XL Records, um, uh, is uh, just I kind of got to know him, really nice guy, and... and um, and his school friend, his, one of his mates, is, was Alex Garland. Is Alex Garland? Oh, okay, so that's and the writer and, and director. Yeah. yeah. And what happened was that he um, uh, he invited me up to London and to meet up with Alex to talk about the Dread film because um, he had read um, that in an interview I just said how much 2018 inspired me in yeah. Dread and and. Um, it was around that time of Terminator and, you know, yeah, all yeah. that stuff that really, you know, was incredible stuff. And then, um, so what happened was that he, he said, come and have a meeting and met up. And me and Alex instantly hit it off. Um, and, but I wasn't keen on getting involved in a film without someone I could work with that... Um, I'll give you a map of how it works. Yeah, yeah, and also I just felt I needed to. I'm not, I'm not, I, 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 want, I hate the idea of pretending I know what I'm yeah. talking about, and I don't, because you get in that situation, you're easily found out, especially in the film world, you know. Yeah. It's just like, they know. It's just like, what do you I mean, want? You're obviously like a deeply collaborative person, but then within music, but then, but film is this huge machine. Yeah, it that, is. It's a very it, different it really world, is, and I, I wouldn't want to let them down. And yeah. I had a really strong idea of, of what I thought it should sound like. 
Um, so I got Ben involved, and then we started working on it, um, which uh, it was through DNA Films, who are, we're still working with. They're really good, you know, nice people. And, and um, we, we started working on Dread, and um, we were doing the demos. To be honest, it was just like a dream come true. I can't, yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, I've been feel like I've worked very hard in music, but very I have been very lucky as well. And then I kind of went, oh my god, I'm working on the Dread yeah. film, and it's going to be heavy. It's not going to be the Stallone one. It's going to be like proper. <laughs> um, and yeah. and um, Alex. W- l- he really, really wanted to do the best thing of the 2000 AD fans and, yeah. and the people that had grown up with it. And, you know. But you were the one that was into the comics. Ben, ben not... No, that's right. right. I yeah. was into the yeah, comics. Yeah. Um, ben was aware of it. And uh, so we started working on it, did the demos, and it was working out really, really well. Mm. And, um, and then... Uh, how can I say this without it kind of sounding weird? But, <laughs> without insulting them. <laughs> yeah, without insulting anyone. <laughs> what happened was that Alex actually was directing and editing the film. He's yeah. down as a writer, but he directed it. And, um, and it was Lionsgate, um, the company, or there was some financial investment or something like this. So it's very cloudy, yeah. and I don't want to get into too much detail, but I think they looked at the film and went, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. this is... I think they expected something a lot more commercially viable and based from the whole film or from yeah, the score from the whole, from right, the whole, the whole thing. thing right and and especially the score yeah um because we would be i had two oberheims um three oberheims and and we were literally coming out of the back of it and like with no effects and yeah. just doing these carpenter-esque hardcore things and then we we started working with this program called Pull Stretch, which I'm sure everyone knows now, which slows yeah. everything down 800 times. You would know it because it, it's famous for the slowing down Justin Bieber, so you can listen to it. Um, <laughs> it's, if it's, you're not a bat or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, it, it sounds like Mogwai yeah. or, 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 you know... Um, I was slightly horrified the other day. I put in a, a bit of bird song into Pull Stretch and obviously tweaked something a bit too far. And it said that the sample it was about to render for me would last eight billion years. Yeah. But there's a guy, yeah. I can't remember the guy's name. He actually did, this is way before I even heard of it. It's a guy who did a Radiohead remix. I don't know if someone would know who it is. Anyone? Any and data? He, and he released it on a, on a three-hour VHS on long play. <laughs> and um, and he, I think that's what he did. He literally took their track, yeah. rendered it, and just recorded it to this. God. Yeah, yeah, so it was eight hours long or what? Like that 24-hour Psycho, you know, when they, did the, they played Psycho, the film, sort of one <laughs> frame a second. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, right. and so um, there was a drug in the film um, uh, that basically slowed down time. So I instantly yeah. thought, this is perfect. Because yeah. what we could do is we could do it in stages. So we could come out of like real time, uh, render a bit, and then render a bit, when it gets slower and slower, and, sl- and to the point where, you know. Um, and, it, and so the people watched the film, the, the powers that be or whatever, and said, look, this is just too odd. And yeah. they didn't particularly not like the score or whatever, but I knew that there was this, gonna be this pressure on mm. the score to kind of change it. And then I, just, then I decided to just say, I, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Um, but is that another moment for you where you come up against big it's business first, again? No, it's the first, it? what it is, it's like, it was going to be our first score together. Yeah. And I just thought... Can't compromise then. If you're going to compromise, compromise I can compromise, especially on Dredge, because it's my childhood. I can, yeah. you know, good luck to anyone who does it. Um, and uh, I can't remember who did it in the end, who did a good job. And, but... It Where was, did it end up then? Did it end up orchestral in the end? In the, in the no, final I don't, one, I don't know. It was like a bit of electronics and right. whatever. So, and then they kept hold of the, the pull stretch thing. So uh, that worked really well. Yeah. And, uh, and so we, we were a bit disappointed and we walked, went off and thought, well, we've got this album now. And because I've got Invader, I just said, let's release it. Let's call it Drock, which means fuck in in um, in 2018. Oh, I didn't know that. In, yeah, in in dread in, <laughs> in Mexico Dreadings. City one, people say Drock and it means fuck. Right. And and um, so we called it Drock and and uh, went to 2000 AD and said, look, can we do this? You know? And they said, look, yeah, yeah. 
um, we'll, right. we'll support it. It's a great album. I love the dryness of it. And also, for anyone who's got a kind of inner John Carpenter, it's, it's a fantastic Well, we listen. brought our massive inner John Carpenter yeah. so much so that yeah. I was kind of embarrassed. But then you just think, oh, sorry, I just make music I like. He, I've, you know, if, I, if we did it and then said, John Carpenter, no, never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tanger Moroder. What? what? Who? Yeah. Who? <laughs> Who? Yeah, so... Um, so that's what we did, and, and we became firm friends with Alex. Um, and he said, next one, you're in, you know, I'm going to fight you're for in. you to be in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that uh, was Ex Machina. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, was, yeah. I remember your life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad you do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's just on my iPad. It's you and um, my poor wife over there. <laughs> Paul Stretch. We're Paul stretching your life. Yeah. Um, so he was, Alex was adamant that you would get a chance and you'd score the next film. Yeah. And it, it feels to me like if, if Drock was a, a really, really kind of firmly in, as you say, three Oberheims yeah. and not much else, uh, Ex Machina seems to be a really interesting blend of, like you were going back, you were saying before about uh, your different talents and, and mm. angles on it. Ex Machina has... Uh, other elements in it that really show that blend. Yeah, well, you know, as, as you almost probably know, because I think you're all pretty uh, educated people in soundtracks, I think I'm sure you are. It, it's that thing that was really hard. Like, um, when you come out of being in a band or whatever, you just think, I'm going to make some music and they're going to play it over this three-minute, you know, section of the film. Yeah. And then you realise actually, you've got to write music to someone making coffee. You know what I mean? <laughs> or, yeah. or, you know, like, you know, un, like, you get bands like, brilliant bands like, like I said, Mogwai, who do kind of Atomic, or, or you know, I think the best score I've heard in years was, the, was Under the Skin, you know. Um, and it's beautiful and amazing, and then it's got those incredibly long scenes which is driving around, and, and the music can just take it's over the whole film. And when you, you know, it's that realization when you're in a, you know, ex machina, it was like a third hand, play, it was like a three part play, yeah. really. And it was lots and lots of dialogue scenes, lots and lots of um, underscore, mm. tons mm. and tons of underscore. It never stopped, you know. And, yeah. um, and, you know, it was about sending people the wrong way, making people feel like they're the hero, but really they're the villain, and just getting really involved in, in um, shaping the film. Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. are... Uh, and then you, you're lucky to have one bit where you can blast. And, you know, um, I think that's a, thing, it's, that's a very difficult thing, yeah. you know. Well, there's a really interesting thing you say about it, actually. You, there's an inter I read an interview with you where you were talking about the, the really specific problems of, like, pads... Mm. you know, uh, in that kind of underscore and getting them right. I don't know if you can say a bit more about that. But... Yeah, well, the thing is, is, is uh, as you lot already know, most probably, because this is what you... <laughs> I, I'm sure you do, is that, is that what's the difference between, a, you know, a crap pad and a good pad under some dialogue? You know what I mean? It, like, it's the same language and it's... But for some reason, you get it wrong. I don't mean to say this the wrong way, but it it could be a like a something from you know neighbours or you know, I'm wrong with that. But I'm just saying Still a it's, pad, but yeah, but a pad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so you've got to start thinking about how you know how can you make something seem different? You know, yeah. if you're bringing, they've hired you to bring something else into it. I mean. You know, a, a, a thing that, you know, a lot of people do, and even, like, the, the best electronic composers do, and, and composers th throughout, is to get that kind of tap delay and, and kind of put a kind of note through it. So it goes... Right. You know, and it's yeah. like... Because it, give, it gives a bit of propulsion yeah. and it gives a bit of intrigue and maybe a bit of tension, and it's... Oh, it sounds so crap, <laughs> you know. And and you're doing it, and you're thinking, is this what I've joined this club to do? Yeah, to go. But then you realise you are working for the film, and you yeah. try and 
you try and find other ways of doing it. And um, it's very difficult. We work with com uh, directors who, who however want you to be complete. I want this to be, I don't want it to sound like this. Yeah. I don't want it to sound like um, CSI Miami. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, yeah, like, yeah. I want it to sound original. Yeah. Um, and then other people are just like, what's that weird sound? It's, it's taking me away from the scene. Yeah. I want to hear, you know, I want to under, uh, underscore it with, with, you know, these movements. And when she says car, I want something to happen, yeah. you know, but yeah. not that. I want something small to happen, you know. So did, you, did you find the whole, there's a whole language I mean, language working with thing, Alex, right? Yeah. I must admit, Alex is, is, a, is a special, special, brilliant writer and director. But oh, God, fuck, he's hard work, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he would be up for me to say that as well. <laughs> <laughs> because we, I mean, you know, we've been, we've been working on Annihilation, his next film, you know. Um, and, you know, we've been doing it over a year. And, um, and it's got, and it's flipped. Like, it's got, like, when you think, okay, well, no white, there's going to be no white in this and no red. And now it's all white and red. Oh, you know God, what I mean? It's, right. it, but, but it's a brilliant thing. It's a process yeah. you've got to do. People work really hard on, on yeah. what they do. And, um... And especially when you want ultimately the the best for the film, yeah, yeah. you know. That's and then, you, usual, then you've got to deal it? with it. That's even before you deal with the studios, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, what's I mean, if if you come from a world of music where, you know, because we all know musicians speak a kind of alien tongue, you know, and and uh, when you have to kind of translate that to the outside world, whether it's to a movie exec or whatever, yeah, it can be yeah. quite tricky. Did you find especially that when quite they odd? know better than you? Yeah, yes. They just know yeah. better than you. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> and they're getting paid to know better than you. So, can we? Can, yeah, can we make it smaller and yet bigger? Yeah, yeah. That's when you give them the special knob. Yeah, in the just studio. Press that. Yeah. yeah, that turns the viola up. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, it. The, a common story would be that you know a film gets made and then a composer gets it dumped on on their desk and they say, mm. yeah, you got three weeks. Whereas it sounds to me like you get on board with these Alex Garland films really early on. Which yeah, I think a lot of directors a I started to, to, to work with composers a lot earlier. I mean, before, I mean, we've just possibly started a, a new film uh, for next year. We've just started, and he wants music to go to take, so whilst he's shooting. Oh, right, OK, so like temp scores that he can work yeah, with. Yeah, yeah but yeah. without, he doesn't want to use temp scores. Yeah. He, he just wants, to, wants us to write. Right. Um, and then come up with a kind of sweet, you know, uh, a, 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 a 20 minutes of music or yeah. whatever, and then he'll take that and then put it against his rushes or whatever. Which is a situation a lot of composers would dream of rather than sort of being well, faced with well, replacing yes, Clint Manson. Well, yes, but then it gives them the opportunity, it gives the directors to change their mind yeah. a thousand red, times. Red, white, red, white, yeah. no red, blue, yeah. blue. Yeah, <laughs> and um, it, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a, obviously it's a quite a... It's a very, very brilliant job if you kind yeah. of get into it. But um, no drumming for you in Ex Machina, there is there? <laughs> no, no, because I, I, the thing is, actually, drums can sound appalling. I mean, in scores. <laughs> I mean, we did uh, Free Fire. That had loads of yeah. drumming, and I played yeah. drums on that a lot. Um, that was really good fun. Now, that, is that the? Um, is it Ben Wheatley? The Ben Wheatley yeah. film, yeah. Which is set. Sort of 1978. Yep, 1978. Yeah, 1978. Well, no, yeah, mid 70s um, uh, in Boston, uh, kind of Irish uh, Republican and and, uh, and uh, kind of a terrorist um, uh, army do a gun deal with a South African yeah. um, in a warehouse, and all the music. Oh, sorry, all the action happens in that warehouse for 120 minutes or whatever. Right. Um, and literally the score is gunfire. Like, you know, um, it's, it's a brilliant, I, I really enjoy it. Have you yeah. like, I mean, it's kind of, people say it's Tarantino-esque. It's just, it's not. It's like all of those films that Tarantino's kind of... Uh, that he's been he's referencing. He's kind of referencing yeah, as well. Yeah. And, um, but that's, I mean, there's a prime example of that. I mean, we were, I mean, Ben's a good mate of ours now. And, and um, but he, it was this scene where there was going to be this, um, chase of shot. It was going to be this chase scene, but instead of it being cars, it was going to be of shot people. Um, which is not in great taste, you know, kind <laughs> of recently. But um, but they're in this warehouse and it's all going wrong. And you don't like all the characters are horrible anyway. And and they kind of shoot each other up. And because 
this, the thing of when you get shot, it can actually, unless it's kind of specific shot, you've been shot somewhere, you survive, you live. Yeah. Uh, so everyone's been shot and it's just how they carry on living right until the end, you know, right. one fall off. But um, what they do is they're crawling themselves, you know, they're crawling a across this floor trying to get to this phone. And this was going to be the, the big music kind of piece of the film. And, and we made it like a... Um, like Magma, or, or uh, it's, a, it's like a 70s, it's like a pub prog piece. Hammond organ, you know, um, loads of phase everywhere and, and a d massive drum solo. And we, we, and we was like, right, so there's not going to be any gunshots, yeah. there's not going to be any dialogue, it's just this, uh, this is our music piece. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, so we did it. Yeah. And it was a whole piece. So it wasn't like tempos changed that you, you could, dragged down, you know, um, we did it and he put it in and he said, oh, well, there's, I think I'm going to put gunshots in it. Oh, no. So, and then the gunshots were fucking loud. I mean, right. like, you know, and they yeah. got subs in them and they're as wide as you could ever imagine. Yeah. And he said, oh, there's a couple of dialogue pieces in it. Mm. And you, so, so you're like, oh, no, how, because we can, you know what it's like when you've got a soundtrack piece and it's very difficult to kind of duck up and down. Yeah, Because yeah. it's just going to sound a bit crap. Yeah. Um, so we, we did this thing, we got into the stems, stems. I don't know if you know if stems are the <laughs> fucking hell. Give, people, give the wrong person stems and your life's over. You know, they are basically the individual, yeah. you know, recorded parts of the score or whatever, and give them well, to... Well, you taking your give lovely them to a music editor thing and, yeah, and just dismembering it and letting yeah. someone else rebuild it. Yeah. And then you end up... They do their it. own special Pro Tools effects yeah. edit mm. on it as well. That bit's gone backwards, or well, that yeah. bit. Oh, what, any reason? No, not really. <laughs> it's, you know, so, um, so, yeah, so it was... Um, so in the end, it was this... It was a... We had to duck this whole piece. And when it was really supposed to be going for it, we had to drop it like 20 dB. Right. Just and it just became a room. rattle. Yeah. You know, and it was for the, you know, it, was, it worked out in the end. But it's that whole thing of when you feel like you've written a piece of music and someone's going to fuck with it somewhere. Yeah, way. yeah. But it's obviously, I mean, yeah, there are lots of problems like that, but you're obviously enjoying it. It's a new, a it's a new it's thing, a new thing, thing for, for me. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like... You know the music. I'm, I'm you know, I'm over 35, <clears throat> just and um, really? and um, and the the modern music industry holds no, I, I no interest in it whatsoever. Yeah. So to be given another opportunity to learn a new industry yeah. is just a brilliant yeah. thing. And you realise how wicked people that work on films, you know, are like from the electricians yeah. and. You that's go a, on, the you, crew mentality. Yeah, you it, go yeah. on set and it's just like, it's, that's why it's brilliant to get involved early on. So when, you know, and it, I think uh, that's anything I would absolutely say, if someone comes to you with a job, then just say, look, is there any chance I could see yeah. you kind get of... Get in early. Get in early, do you a playlist of what I'm thinking. Or, it's really, because it's really exciting, yeah. you know, to sit on one of them buses and eat, and eat chili con carne with the crew, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, the glamour. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's, it's yeah, good yeah. fun. And, and yeah. you know, I've, been, I've been in Pinewood, you know. It's like mm. making, you know, Star Wars that end, you know, and there was a little, tiny little area hired for annihilation, <laughs> like a cupboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you wasn't were in Star in Wars, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or oh, and recording in saber. air, you know, rec yeah. recording in air again. We did a lot of Port Z stuff in air, but to actually yeah, to go back go there, back there yeah. 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 And just briefly, in terms of in the room, um, you and Ben, you know, like, who's doing what? How are you presenting sort of ideas and thoughts to each other? It's pretty what? good, actually. I mean, we, we um, it's pretty good. I mean, we, we work at his mum's house. Um, you know, I've got a studio that, you know, it's a posh kind of studio in Bristol that looks yeah. like Phil Collins could walk in and do that drum solo any minute. And Sushi but, available. Yeah, no. but... Um, it's, he's got all his gear in his mum's house and it's, aesthetically, it's hanging. Right. You know what I mean? And so, <laughs> I mean, but it just doesn't matter. We're not those kind of people, really. There's, yeah. like, bits of nose flute, broken nose flute in the corner <laughs> when he was doing <laughs> the Andes. Sounds or like something. a biohazard. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so we just sit there and, and um, he's 
got the controls. He, he'll never say that he's like any kind of engineer. Right. And um, we just demo everything. Yeah. We just like, you know, um, record stuff. And, and it's, it's more about coming up with a, vo you know, a vibe. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we record it as demos and then we realise that we should have recorded it properly. <laughs> Because it's covered in hiss and it's yeah. just got rubble his mum The cars are going past. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spending the next four weeks trying to remove a taxi yeah. going past that. Like, and then the exec goes, hey, I really love that taxi. Where yeah, did yeah. that go? This yeah, is can we different have from back? the demo, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> There's a great... I, I read you saying at, um, you, at one point that um, you were too old for dubstep. I presume it was probably a few years ago, obviously. Yeah, but, but that's, that's, I was too old yeah, for it, and that was yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah, but you, it, there was a really interesting angle to it, which was you said that it wasn't so much the music, it was the places one had to go to to consume dubstep yeah. that you were too old for. And it made me think about kind of music and places and buildings and, and the speciality of certain studios and places for music and, you know, how obviously so much of what you've done is rooted in, in and around Bristol, yeah. both from the, your collaborators and all the yeah. rest of it. And we can get through this whole bit without uttering the word trip-hop. No, too late. Oh, oh dear. Because I know that was never, never really a comfortable. Uh, no, I mean, label, you, you, no, it's just absolutely. It was, it was really, really strange. I was talking to, the, to Mushroom from Massive Attack the other day, and um, he, you know, he's been out in the wilderness and he's just about to come back. Um, and like, it's, it's just so, so funny. It was just like a pocket that people could put in. It's like mm. Manchester, or yeah. you know, in the Manchester scene, and and. Uh, the Canterbury folk scene or, yeah. you know, it was, it was just one of those things and it was just an easy way for, for um, you know, Italian record companies, like yeah. the Italian, like, version of, of Universal to sell their another crap Versions band. Versions of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Just like, oh, yeah, trip-hop, yeah. you know, they're very trip-hop. And it's like, oh, yeah. I'll buy it then. And, um, and we, historically, there's a, there's a scene in Bristol, but it, it's not, it, it's not actually um, defined by mine or massives or or um, or a tricky or yeah. more tricky. Tricky is actually the closest I think to to represent Bristolians um, and the way that actual Bristolians are as people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because he he's still he's still a kind of punk. You know, he's got that punk ethic to him, and and I think that he he basically represents Bristol and Bristol music more than 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 any of the other bands. I mean, because he kind of like Mark Stewart and the Mafia, um, like kind of dub punk basically, yeah, yeah. and humour, and and um, and you know the you know. Do you still think it exudes all those all those things? The, the, well, the no, sort of because scene? of homogenization of, of of everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is is a is a problem when it comes down to culture, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so so, no, it's not so around. But there's a band called the Idols, uh, or not the Idols. They're just called Idols, and they're a punk band from Bristol. And I would say they're exactly that. Right. And and every time I see them, I'm just like, yep, that's exactly yeah, yeah. what it should that's be. That's what it's about. Because yeah. they're, they're really funny to watch. Yeah. There's a sense of humour yeah. um, that goes along with the music. If you look at any of the art that comes out of Bristol that's, and any of the music, you know, you, you kind of talk to, you think, you know, me, at like at Port Z and Mass Attack would be quite serious or whatever, but really, <laughs> we, you know, we'd probably have a, have a good laugh, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I can definitely warble on, but I just want to check if anything... If, if, does anyone want to ask anything at this point? Crikey. Bored to yeah. death. Yeah. Is anyone... They, well, want to, okay. they want to get to the bar. Yeah, it's calling out to them. Um, well, it just... Because that re it reminds me of that Dave, the David Byrne thing on how music works, about how specific venues and places kind of really yeah. shape the music that comes out of them as much as the bands themselves, you know. Yeah, whole. but it's, Bristol is, is a very kind of... It's actually... Uh, uh, there's a brilliant book by Derek Robson called The Darker Side of Bristol. It's only a little paperback. And, um, and it's... It, if you really want to actually find out what true Bristol... I mean, I don't know how much you want to, but how, what, you know true Bristolians are like, read that book. Yeah. They're apathetic. They don't really care about politics much. As long as there's some cider, 
Um, <laughs> some drum and bass. Some drum and bass and some weed. And, mm -hmm. and um, they're pretty, ha pretty happy, you know what I mean? It's like uh, they didn't want the end to slavery. Um, they rioted because it was, they were all making good money. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's wrong. But that yeah. was then, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's, like, there's lo lots of things that kind of, um, you know, Bristol's seen as kind of very right on, and, and it, it's, it's not really. They're just like, don't like being told something by somebody. Right. So they'll, they'll stand up to that and just go, yeah, mate, fuck off. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, um, but yeah, like I said, it's, you know, hopefully you never lose that and it's art and it's culture and it's... Sure. Yeah. Your, your first sort of job in the studio was a, were you a tape hop? No, I was a T-boy. T-boy. Yeah. I, I'd never, I was, I was a rubbish engineer. I still am. I have no real, I have no interest in Pro Tools um, or I've only just switched to Logic last year. Right. Um, we still use Radar, um, which is a kind of standalone digital unit that sounds a bit like tape. Um, and I don't care what microphone you use. I don't, uh, the worst thing ever is what happened with Pro Tools when, walk into the studio and people were talking Pro Tools. That was, yeah. to me, that was kind of, I'm like, I, I have no idea. Yeah. I banned it from, from sessions of just like, can you, if you want to talk about Pro Tools, do it outside. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like a dirty <laughs> habit. <laughs> no, Don't it's do like, that in here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like, how good is that recreation of a, of a, 90, of a Pi compressor compared to that yeah. company's version of a yeah. Pi compressor? Does it compress? Does it sound all right? Yeah. But in a way, you've totally answered my next question, which was really about how do you sort of cope with the thing that a lot of composers deal with now, which is the infinite possibility of everything you get your hands on. I mean, yeah, you know. but it, randomly, it's weird. It's like someone does, like Michael Levy does something, like, you know, under the skin, and then, like, everything you hear for the next six months well, is like, like that. It yeah, like, yeah. And there was, a, there was a Black Mirror that I heard that, that literally they just obviously tempt with it. Yeah. And it was just like, can you do that? And he's like, whoever did it went, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Fair play. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's he going to say? No, I can't do that. You know, I don't, it's a, com it's a commercial business, you know, and um, um, the trouble is, 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 is uh, also is that uh, if you, it's a couple of things that I've realized is that there are some brilliant people writing some brilliant music, like um, Matt Quayle, who does Mr. Robot. You know, and um, who scores it? The, the yeah. soundtrack to it, and, and and is that released on your yeah? On your yeah, that's label? the other thing. Yeah. I, I so so I I know a lot of these soundtracks because I set up Invader Records back then, and the first band was this Gonga band, you know. Yeah. And then since then, there's this guy who works with us called Reg, and he's our manager. Uh, and he went and saw Drive the movie, and just went, "You've got to watch Drive. The the, the soundtrack's amazing." And I'm like, "We've got to try and get it." And I'm like. Get out! There's no way we're gonna get it. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know what he did, but he used to work at um, a dance label where they used to license a lot of stuff, and got in contact with whoever it was and said, "Can we license the vinyl?" And yeah, they went, "Yeah." yeah. And um, yeah, so, got... so in Europe, we licensed the vinyl, and then we we now partner up with a company called Lakeshore Entertainment in America, and we literally have like Invader Records. Is we've got Invader Studio. And then the record company is, you know, is the size, yeah. size of this right. here. And then all the records are on the wall. And then people, you know, buy them online from our shop. And, we, and Ali puts them in an envelope yeah. and sends them. And you've got lovely vinyls of Stranger Things. Yeah, we've got, in, I mean, yeah. since we did that, we now, we can, you know, like we do Stranger Things, Handmaid's Tale. Uh, uh, um, Mr. Robot. Yeah, well, Mr. Yeah. Robot. Um, uh, what's the, Moonlight. Um, it, it, we're really lucky, and, and we've just done the, the um, uh, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis scores uh, for, for um, Wind River. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's brilliant, and, and getting to know people that do it, like getting to know Warren or getting to know Clint Mansell, um, yeah, yeah. you know, is, is a, a brilliant thing. You realise the shit they've got to put up with as composers. Right. You know, you kind of think that you kind of, you know, oh, it's like, well, you know, Asaticus Ross, yeah. well, you haven't fucked with him. Yeah, they do. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, do you want to spill any beans? No, on that? no, of course I don't. You know what I mean? But but what I mean is, it, it, you know, it's so true about that job. That like Johan Johansson and, and Blade Runner, you know, getting mm. bumped off. Mm. It's mm. like, what is that about? Yeah. You know, yeah. but it's a, you know, it's like they say, you're not a composer until you've been fired. 
yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're it's a very, you know, they believe in, you know, it's a very true thing, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's some classic films that's, you know, 2001 um, was scored, wasn't it? And then bombed. Oh, yeah, lots of Ligeti and stuff like yeah, that. And, there, yeah, and then, so I think you've got to expect it. Yeah. I mean, the, the weirdest thing now is when you, when you deliver your music and then you deliver your stems, and a lot of people were quite cool with it, that they then watch the TV show or the, or the film or whatever it is, and then they've just remixed it. So it's, you've just mm. been remixed yeah. by someone who hasn't got a clue about what you've done. Mm. I mean, if, 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 unless they ask for the stems, I don't send them. Yeah. Because it's like, man, who's, who, how, what do you know about what, why we put that shaker there? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If you want us to do something, send us a note and we'll put it up, you know. And then on top of that, is you write a, a piece for something and then you, uh, and it's like some emotional bit and it's been put over some action bit. And it's been done by, you know, oh, it's not quite right. And you just think, well, that, that's yeah. surely not right. <laughs> but, um, and then a lot of the big TV shows, especially the Netflix ones, that's what it seems like it happens. Yeah. You know, you just think, that's, I watched, um, I mean, we released The Handmaid's Tale, but there was one, I've watched uh, one recently and I just thought, no, the composer didn't want that to happen. And, mm-hmm. and I don't think, I don't think anyone meant that to happen. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's just weird because it's not like, well, you know, it's not like there's the orchestra, you've yeah. played this part, you've delivered it. Yeah. Nothing I can do with that now. No. I mean, it's quite scary. Yeah, well, it's a scary thought. But that's the commercial <laughs> industry that yeah. we live in, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you once said about running a label that, it turned out to be a great way of spending money and losing, losing friends. friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah how, you... I mean, that was obviously a while back. Well, how is it now? How do you feel? Same, same rules apply? Yeah, same rules apply, other than, than we're very lucky that we, we release these, these soundtracks. So when you work with a band, um, you know, there's a, there's a band called Scarlet Rascal signed, you know, like a, a four-piece guitar band. And then you have to start from scratch. You have to go, right, here's a plugger. Here's a press person. You pay for the recording. You um, pay for you. You buy them a Ford Galaxy so they can go on tour. You know what I mean? You yeah, do all this yeah. stuff. And it's an investment. Yeah. And then if you get the Stranger Things soundtrack, okay, it's yeah, not like you have to do any promotion for it. It's fucking Stranger itself. Things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But every, the world knows about it. Yeah. So what? You can just literally go, "Hello, world. We've got these," There's and people just thing. go, "Give yeah. it." Yeah. And you're just like, wow, this is a better business plan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be. Um, and we've just been very, very lucky, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's getting to the point where, you know, vinyl's going up. It's really weird because there is a bit of a problem. And it sounds like weird industry stuff, but it's a problem where, where you know, a double vinyl record, you know, you go through a distributor. And a lot of record shops now are boutique shops. They're mm-hmm. literally like, furniture shops are set up by people who love vinyl you yeah. know um they're not you know uh, the bigger ones are dying out except yeah, from the sure. rough trades yeah. so they can't take a risk on new bands because they've got to pay like 12 quid an album of a band that they've never heard of yeah. so it's like no i want to buy stuff that people like you know because you know i've got mates who've got record shops and it's they really run on an edge you know yeah yeah um so it's a, it's a t- it is a tough time for that side of the industry. Yeah, yeah. And um, also, the, the thing is as well, it's, when it comes to composing, I was going to say, is that, is that, you know, the kind of sample libraries are great, you know, but you, if you're not careful, you're going to sound... There's a point where you want to sound professional, mm-hmm. and then you, there's a point where you just sound like everyone else. Because you're using yeah, well, the same the, samples. Yeah, the biggest struggle, isn't it, is finding yeah, your own... Yeah, it is a problem. So it's almost yeah. like if you write stuff and then you've been paid enough so you can work out your own way of doing stuff. I yeah. mean, like, I, I, you know, we use... I, I, I bet I never want to do stuff that... I've, I've, you know, it's like company-based stuff. Cause yeah. It's, just too weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we actually do use Spitfire stuff, you know. And Plug. Um, no, we do because it's really good. They offer Arnold stuff, and the, I mean, it's the was it the contemporary string yeah. thing? It was, I mean, properly good, odd stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and but you have to. That's you, the line I don't know if everyone else. I don't know if everyone like, does this for a living, but but 
I find that most of the time you get these samples, sample libraries and you spend most of the time just taking off their effects. Removing stuff, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's just grim. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, and this stuff's not like that, really. Um, any, and just a quick check if anyone wants to ask anything. Who wants a pint? Who wants a pint? Oh, look, a Who question. wants a pint? Quick, a rare breed. <laughs> yeah, uh, I read somewhere about the process you realised terrified by Marcus. And uh, you still use the idea of something like sessions and build it up in something new, something different. And it's related to the nature of the sound of that album. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, we still do that kind of uh, in the soundtrack world as well. Um, we would we would make a track, like on Free Fire, we made a track sound like kind of pub prog. Um, so, you know, and we would play it in a way that they're not the greatest of players. They're more like a bunch of mates that have studied Genesis or something. And, and, and they record, you know, they play in pubs and this is a recording that they did in someone's garage. You know, it's like, or they hired a studio for it. We try and make a kind of story up for every thing. And what would it sound like? Would he have a crap snare? Yeah, he would have a bit of a crap snare. And they wouldn't, it would only be two mics or... And we try and do that. And then, so you kind of... So it gives... With the film, it, be, it becomes believable. If it's a period piece, then it sounds period. It, it's not just someone playing blues guitar in a style of, you know which is incredibly common. It's actually, it's the real deal. You're putting in time to paint that wall and put kind of 1975 uh, plugs on the wall. Why shouldn't I spend the same amount of time making something that sounds like the real deal? You know what I mean? And, and when you do, you watch it and you go, yeah, it, it now works. And that was the same thing with Porter's Ed. When we, we would, you know, do things like numb or what you know we would play it and we'd try and record it and and make it sound like it was a from a a, a blue note jazz record and push it you know press it to vinyl take it out in the garden jump around on it a bit <laughs> wash it off and then resample it because it's that's what you're doing you know um yeah uh, mm. uh, and so yes we do bring that same stuff into film you know and i think that, what it, i believe in the sonic unconscious in, in a sense of i always have that people, even if they don't know it's not a real track, they will know that it's fake. And, and they will know that and they'll feel that and that will upset the, the film as well. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of times, you know, you get, you kind of hear someone doing some blues stuff that's supposed to be or it's, I mean, it's terrible, isn't it? You know, I mean, you've got to do your research. If someone wants something, it's got to be it. Well, I suppose if you come you know, to experimenting with sound through hip hop as opposed to what used to be called, you know, electroacoustic music or something. Yeah. There's always that element of the real in there, isn't there? It's, it's always from a kind of real source. Well, apparently. yeah, because it was nicked from yeah. real records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, it's very, very You're difficult. You're very aware of atmosphere and place and time in yeah, the sound. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's about bad recordings. Yeah. It's about unbalanced um, an unbalanced record. Most of the records that you love in your collection that are old are unbalanced. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. they're not balanced records. It's you back know. to the idea that we're all trying to reintroduce the, reintroduce the, the, the human, human yeah. element of... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, any, other qu any other questions? Because do we, do we need to? We need to stop. Um, okay. Jeff, uh, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank Thanks you so for much. Um, putting up um, with me. And thank you all for being a really great crowd. Thanks. <laughs>